You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany. Welcome back to WCDB Albany. You are listening to The Social Workers talk radio show here on WCDB. And my name is Eric Hardiman. I'm the co-host of this show with Alyssa Lotmore. Welcome back, Alyssa. Hey, Eric. We have an exciting show for you today, for everyone today. We certainly do. We've got a great show lined up. We've got another faculty member from the University of Albany with us today. And it's always great for us when we have faculty members. It's great when we have students and we have members of the U Albany community because we get to share what's going on at the university and sort of broaden the conversation that we're having beyond the university and out into the community. So we're excited about this. Uh, if you haven't listened to The Social Workers before, Alyssa, you know, maybe could you give us a little introduction to the show and tell listeners what, what it's all about? Well, we are a radio talk show. We are also on podcast version now. And we really see the public as a client. How do we get people to who may never have considered seeing or using a social worker? How do we keep people informed? So we have a lot of social work uh, faculty, community members, and even students come on the show to share their expertise and to share resources with not only other social work professionals, but also members of the community. Because social work, Eric, as you know, and it's a very broad field. And there are social workers in many different agencies, from hospitals to schools, work with veterans. I mean, it, we're everywhere. So how do yeah. we get people to know about who we are and what we do? And how do we get people to have some extra resources? Um, so that's one of the purposes of the show. Yeah. And I think right now in this particular time in our country, it's a time when social work has a role to play in educating the public and sharing our knowledge base. And so our, our guest today is a really wonderful example of that. So uh, let me introduce her. We have with us Dr. Julia Hastings. Dr. Hastings is associate professor in both the schools of public health and the School of Social Welfare at the University of Albany. She's interested in reducing health, economic, and service utilization burdens for racially diverse populations. Her research covers three core thematic areas, physical and mental health disparities, for example, type two diabetes, depression, and oral health, welfare participation, and poverty. Dr. Hastings is currently principal investigator of black family stress and caregiving of loved ones diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. She enjoys serving on the Black Child Development Community Board. And in 2019, she was named Public Health Social Worker of the Year by the Public Health Social Work Section of the American Public Health Association. That's a, a wonderful honor and uh, we're excited to have you with us, Julia. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. I, I think this is going to be a wonderful experience for all of us. Now, Julia, you recently did a presentation at the very well attended UAlbany Research Coffee Hour, and you posed a question of how a person can stay mentally healthy when they already have been impacted adversely for years of racial injustice and multiple traumas such as poverty and violence. Can you talk a little about what you've been noticing these past few months with COVID and why this is such an important topic? Oh my goodness. It the last few months, I would say society in general, we we have come to light and and I don't know if we've come to grips, but it definitely has risen about the divisiveness and diversity and opinion and um because of COVID, there was I think a renewed sense of disparities in health outcomes. Um it was very alarming in the I think the early months March, April, when it was recognized that that people of color, particularly blacks, were were passing away from COVID-19 at higher rates than any other racial or ethnic group. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you know, there wasn't a lot of attention to data collection on race. But but when it was recognized, that's when it, this renewed sense of, well, what do we do in our communities? It kind of took off. And uh, it made paying attention to race and paying attention to ethnicity and health outcomes primarily more important. I'm glad you're here to talk about this because there needs to be more conversation about it. And 
this is not something new for you, correct? This has sort of been your passion for a long time. I mean, you're with the School of Social Welfare, but also the School of Public Health. So tell us a little bit about how you got into this and having this be your area of research. Well, this actually, yes, this what, what's happening right now is actually right at the point of what excites me about research hmm. in that um, being part and understanding kind of the social existence and experience of the Black community is really trying to understand how do we help um, a group of people who have had historical um, oppressive um, racist experiences that have dehumanized existence. There have been a lot of violent events in our in our society that has risen to um, national attention. And but there is also that other side about social work that we have to think about, well, where do people go? Where do communities go in order to mm -hmm. feel better and to kind of work through all of these experiences? Um, what I have found in kind of my interest is really trying to understand mental wellness against all of this um, stigma that is around about trauma, about um, the repeated stories that we read in um, the news or we see in the news and trying to understand, well, what do we do with that in order to help people become healthier? And yeah. that is the bridge that I have between public health and social work is that I, I thoroughly enjoy the treatment side that social work provides. And in public health is trying to understand a uh, community sense is that how do you look at a broader community to help communities move forward? And um, I'd like to liken that to when we think about communities that have experienced, um, well, we, we kind of pretty up the term as like violence, but when they have mass shootings or then when a community member is shot by, we have it um, by law enforcement, or, or even just death in hospitals. We have to think about how, how do we help people move forward beyond just like the normal grieving process and mental health, particularly depression, is, they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're experiences that people have. And for blacks, it's been one of those tough conversations to have because it's, 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 it's culturally, it's, that's something that we, we ignore. And I don't know as a culture, we probably have taught ourselves or have passed on to the next generations that it's actually a privilege of being, um, to, to be vulnerable. Because part of, part of what the, our culture has taught us is that you need to find strength and move and move forward in spite of. Um, and there's there's a tool that takes on the body when you do that. And, and I like to study it like where where do we kind of acknowledge that we've had enough and that we need to kind of move forward and to seek treatment to be better, better whole people yeah. um, to enjoy our experiences a little bit more in life. And I know, you know, it wouldn't be fair to ask you to look into the future, but but certainly we're living at a time right now where these conversations have become. Uh, more public and more present and more frequent conversations about race itself, conversation about um, sociopolitics, of course, but also conversations about mental health. And we're starting to see in the pandemic situation that how uh, different communities, different groups of people within society respond to the challenges of being isolated, for example of yeah. uh, of losing hope of 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 possibly grief and loss lo losing loved ones to the pandemic um, these conversations and the extent to which those challenges intersect with race are becoming more normalized i think and and so i wonder if you could talk for a few minutes about how um how you see that changing in the in the near future do you think those conversations uh, you know the expansion of those conversations will have a positive impact I am very, Eric, I think you, you pinpoint where, where my excitement is at this time, is that while, while we've all kind of experienced the kind of trauma of, of listening to stories and about people um, dying very tragically, um, the conversations about race, the conversations about health truly are making it um, 
a normal, a normal experience for all of us to have thoughts and to talk, to openly converse about what we are feeling. And that has been, um, I think, one of the roadblocks into seeking treatment among the black community is that um, we are in a time right now that 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 pretty much the topic of choice whenever we see um, folks either on the Zoom, like we're, we're doing all these Zoom meetings, or whether we're talking to people on the phone is really sharing our how we feel about what we are experiencing, how we're experiencing these struggles um, about family loss, about friend loss, about the loss of, of just kind of socially being around other people. And this this is the starting point that, that I think we need to be at in order to kind of normalize, well, what does it mean to be mentally healthy? And so this is this is a very this while this is a tragic time for all of us, it is a very good time for help seeking behavior. Interesting. And so you as Eric was saying, the conversations are starting. I mean and the mainstream media is covering it, but there's also another part, and that's the studies and the research. So can you go into a little bit about your new study that looks at how the black community fared between March and June of this year during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Yes, I mean, the. I will say the kind of studies that I, I have done in the past and, and currently involved in really had nothing to do with COVID-19, but all of the health behaviors that we were teaching the public to practice, like wearing a face mask, staying at home, social distancing, um, washing your hands, disinfecting services. I was very curious how how people could rapidly transform themselves into performing these behaviors that um, perhaps we did the disinfecting surfaces piece, perhaps we did the distancing piece a little bit, but not too much. Um, but how do we keep um, practicing these behaviors in order to, to get the notion of staying infection free or, or reducing our ability to be infected? And so the, the study that I um, found and given, given the evidence that, that persons in the black community were dying at higher rates, I was thinking about, well, what's the one of the main entities that, that was culturally relevant and remained open to the time when society pretty much shut down and everything closed? And that was the church. And so I, I was speaking with some friends of mine. Um, we were making observations about the kinds of things we were seeing and the studies that we were producing, because at that time, all research really had to come to a halt if it's face to face. Um, and so we wanted to know kind of how did people make sense of their lives, given that we had to do that rapid transformation. And so I thought about kind of what does this mean in the community sense? And so churches really did come come to the forefront. And so the study that I um, crafted, and, and, and I'm still currently working on collecting data, is um, it's like COVID-19 in the Black church and, and kind of where are the intersections between hope and prosperity and health. And in that study, it's really trying to understand how, how Black churches, which have historically been seen as places for knowledge, for um, spiritual growth, for um, socialization to, to new processes and for, for social justice action and, and to really find out what, what is kind of that role in that space and how they function with helping, helping Blacks to improve their mental health. Um, I would say the, the, the study started out with me being kind of very optimistic and saying, oh, yes, this is the space. But then I was using a mentality where, you know, like the old mentality that we're always going to physically go to a space. Um, so I, I really had to rapidly transform my thinking and, into looking online and think where churches were actually passing on information and how did they communicate with congregants. And it was very interesting to learn that some black churches communicated very easily and well, was very transparent with their congregations about how to continue on with the services that they were providing, um, communicating uh, about COVID-19 behaviors, keeping, the, keeping their uh, congregants informed. And other, and other churches were, were less so, where um, you could actually see that, that they didn't transform so so rapidly to, to this new electronic way of being. 
And in that, there were there were really um, interesting findings in that we learned a lot about how to how do you keep up your spiritual positivity um, given given the transformation of the church. And so um, we were also looking at kind of uh, or listening to what the sermon contents were. And sermon, and it's interesting enough, without prompting from any research or anything, it's just listening to all uh, a number of sermons, is that pastors really have worked in um, kind of health behavior and a spiritual message that is based kind of in their in their um, understanding of the Bible, and that that has been fascinating about how hope and prosperity has been passed on to community members. So that mm-hmm. that was also a point where where mental wellness came into play. It's it's fascinating listening to you because I hear so many uh, dimensions to your research and so many intersections. And so for someone who's doing research that is intersectional like this, that deals with culture, spirituality, health behaviors, mental health, help seeking, you know, you, you have multi family community, you've got multiple angles here, so to speak. Um, what do you ultimately hope, you know, um, as, as someone who also does research, what do you ultimately hope that the results from your study uh, will have? You know, what's, what type of impact do you think it'll have on both practice realities and sort of on the community, but then also in, in potentially in the policy world? Well, what I'm hoping is that um, when, when we talk about policy, that's the easiest one for me to approach first is that a lot of times when policies are kind of passed or rapidly passed if we've experienced it it's it's not always done in consultation with what's actually happening in the community or in communities that that need more support um there was an expectation that that everyone could rapidly transform themselves into following every health behavior possible and um what what kind of what my research uncovers is that that's not always the case. There were people who needed um, additional resources, additional assistance. And for policies, I would say to 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 take into account the voices that are not normally heard when when we have to pass on health messages as critical as this one. Um, I think moving down to treatment, where we are right now is that we can now have conversations about how do you end the stigma of mental illness um, among blacks in general since culturally that is mental talking about mental illness is really not discussed as much even though we're having conversations about these experiences we now have an open entree an open door to to talk about depression to talk about anxiety to talk about um, feeling isolated, um, to talk about feeling um, dehumanized in experiences with with um, kind of figures of authority, and this leads me to kind of where I like to do the work. It's like how do we get folks to understand that seeking treatment and seeking help outside of the family or even outside of um, moving beyond church structures. Um, is a step forward and is a step for um, kind of reclaiming wellness, not just in the physical sense, but also in the mental sense. It's like, how do we get people to kind of build build a stronger self, given that there are all of these different competing um, social complexities that, that impinge upon their resiliency as human beings? And I, and I do think that that's a place for us to start growing. Thank you, Jill. And, uh, oh, go ahead, Eric. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Alyssa. No, I just was curious as practitioners, as social workers who are in the field, and we mentioned things like the multiple traumas, the ongoing racial injustice, poverty, and that ripple effect of COVID nineteen with job loss. You know, now childcare issues due to schools, you know, going more remote, a greater exposure for individuals if they're essential workers. As a practitioner, and we, if if this is uh, what individuals on our caseload or our clients are experiencing, where do we start in terms of addressing some of these these needs? Is it so complex? Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, and this I must I must give a little shout out to my my social welfare six six one class evaluation of clinical practice. This is exactly what we're talking about in class. As as social workers are out there, um, the training ones are training now. Those that are working out there, it really is trying to understand how someone tells you their story and then prioritizing about what do we start with first? Because there is there is a long list of what people are dealing with at this time. And um, how do we understand um, transforming ourselves into being a helper that people see, that they, that they can see that, yes, you can hear me, you can help me move forward. And then how do we, how do we share that experience of growth? Um, so I think new social workers and practicing trans social workers have the best opportunity right now to be um, passionate listeners, to be the ones to to continue this conversation that we talked about, about, well, kind of how how are people faring? And then really to break down those those stigma barriers about asking for help and then seeking wellness. Um, I think social workers are in the perfect time, in the, at least in the capital region, um, if not everywhere, to really kind of make inroads into if we are to achieve health equity in its broadest sense, this is where we start. This is what we're doing. And I think this is what social workers have always been trained to do. So this is this is truly our time. Ooh, that was like really inspiring. I'm going to have to audit your class and get a little refresher. I, that was even you've, you've inspired me as a social worker to to continue to to work and um, yeah, this was I, I really this is really great that you're teaching the the students in your class how to tackle something like something so complex. I was just going to say something very similar, Alyssa, which is that I, it's really nice to hear uh, someone talk about that intersection between research and teaching and bringing what you're doing in your research studies into the classroom and inspiring students and getting them to think about practice and policy even in different ways. Uh, so if you've just tuned in, we're having an interview, we're having a conversation with uh, Dr. Julia Hastings from the School of Public Health and the School of Social Welfare at the University of Albany. Uh, Alyssa, do you have more questions? No, I think this is a great overview, Julia, and I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything that you would like to leave our listeners with? Any resources or tips about things that you've learned so far during your study? Anything that you'd like to leave us with as we continue to move on and go to, you know, continue to try to address these needs of the different populations that are being disproportionately impacted? I, I really, I would. I mean, I really believe that our strength as social workers really is grounded in relevance and, and in human relevance of our, of our existence. And um, I believe more focus really does need to be paid attention to right now to wellness rather than marking illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and if we were to make kind of inroads into this, this cultural mistrust that I alluded to earlier, I would say it really is working on that relationship that helping and seeking help is, uh, is a, a straight pathward, you know, pathway forward. And to sh kind of shift our focus to really recognize what we mean by resilience. Um, a mm -hmm. resilient strength-based focus. I think we, we spend a lot of time as social workers talking about resilience, but now is the time I think we need to kind of reinvest some energy to really think about, well, what does that mean at this time? So I guess I would say if I were to leave anybody with um, kind of like the message in March to go forward, I would challenge all of us to, to be true advocates um, for everyone, but particularly those that have been um, cast as marginalized or cast as outside of a, a normal operating um, group and to really advocate and try to strengthen kind of what we call this fragile safety net of services that we've put together in order to, to welcome mental wellness. And I think that's how you start building um, stronger communities. If you, if you really think about focusing on wellness and focusing on um, kind of breaking down those cultural mistrust barriers of seeking treatment. And, and you've really shown us through your conversation here 
the uh, the increasing relevance of your work that your work is grounded in the community that it's grounded in the realities that communities experience and that people within these populations experience and that it's it's really highly relevant right now in today's uh today's world so i want to thank you so much for being our guest today dr hastings thank yes, you and Julia. tell everybody to vote 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 share your voice <laughs> absolutely uh, you've been listening to The Social Workers, and we've been talking with Dr. Julia Hastings from the School of Public Health and the School of Social Welfare at the University of Albany. Alyssa, we've been having uh, these, these podcast interviews throughout COVID. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what do we have any coming up scheduled that we want to share with listeners? I know we've always got a rotating cast of, of new interviews and new episodes and uh, it's always exciting to think about what's what's coming down the road. We're continuing to come out with new episodes. Uh, next week, we'll be interviewing some members of the Internship and Aging Project, because this is the 20th anniversary of the that program at the University at Albany School of Social Welfare. And that is a program that the students are specifically focused on working with the aging population. Um, and also, speaking about health and wellness, yesterday I did an interview with two individuals who are doing an upcoming workshop through the School of Social Welfare's Continuing Education Program. And it was focused on yoga, cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's really talking about that mind and body connection and how the both, you know, how do we address both? So they they came up with this uh, new framework, this and it's, it's really interesting. So they'll be doing an upcoming workshop through the School of Ed Social Welfare and uh, a three-part series. And that episode came out yesterday. So it is available already for people to listen to, but a lot of exciting things coming in the future for the show. As always, there's no shortage of, of topics to talk about here on The Social Workers. Sometimes we can't keep up, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for listening. You've been listening to WCDB Albany. You're listening to The Social Workers on WCDB Albany.